had to suffer all alone. He came for all mankind to bridge the great divide and somehow ended up alone. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know that kind of loneliness. Your spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. like to walk these roads. But my problems don't compare to that crown you had to wear. But still you take them as your own. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all the pain and carried all the shame when you made that rugged tree a righteous road. Because of you. that song, although I did miss his wife helping him out. I like harmony. Brother Justin did a fine job, but I do like harmony. So we all pray for her that she gets better because he needs it. Um, well, I hope you didn't come here to leave. And I hope that you're here to let God do something because it is time for the preaching. Take your Bible. Number one, Malachi one. Good to see each of you in your places tonight. Thank you for coming out. My wife sends her best. I forgot to say yesterday to you all as a group that uh, our missions agency, we have 
a bank, a primary banking partner that we use, and because that bank had some changes, we had to move all of our missionaries' accounts to another bank, and so that changed her whole summer, and uh, so she is just now in the last few weeks of making that change, and that's why we changed our plans for her to stay there and do her job so I could be here. But, uh, but I appreciate so much your willingness to come out and to be here tonight. Made a new friend tonight. Kyle's here. Thank you, Kyle, for coming. Right? It's Kyle. Good. Casey, good to see you as well. Glad you're here. Malachi 1 is where we're starting tonight. We're talking about when God criticized Israel. What does that mean? When God criticizes. It's one thing when people criticize us. But the authority of criticism is based upon the person who's making the criticism. If somebody in passing says something unkind to you, you can easily dismiss that and say, well, you know what, I really don't know them, they don't really know me, I can dismiss it. But when God shows up and says, this is what's wrong in your life, then it is vital that we pay attention. And in fact, what God did was, he gave them seven criticisms. And now I've not shown you all of those criticisms, but I am putting them on the screen for you tonight so you can see where we're going. In the first criticism, which is designated by the word wherein, that is to say, <coughs> in what way did we do that? Or they challenged God by saying so. They challenged God when God said, you've lost a sense of your love, my love for you. And they said, wherein hast thou loved us? They doubted the very love of God. God pointed out to them last night, we saw in verse number 6, that they lost their sense of his honor that was due to his name. Verse number 6 showed us that. Verse number 7 tonight is where we'll, we will be studying in just a moment. But in verse number 7, we're going to talk tonight about God's holiness, that they actually lost their sense of the holiness of God. And when that happens in our life, and maybe I could point it to you this way. I see them somewhat progressive. If I lose a sense of God's love for me, then I will readily or easily lose my sense of God's honor. And then I will lose a sense of God's holiness. I see these as progressive or in truth regressive. They just get in worse and worse. But also we'll see in the other where-ins, as we have them here on the screen, you've lost your sense of my righteousness, chapter 2, verse 17. And what I'm showing you here is, is that in case I don't finish all this material for the week, at least you know what I would have said. You lost your sense of my righteousness. And you say, well, there's a closeness between righteousness and holiness, yes, but holiness is his character. Righteousness, and we'll talk about that tomorrow night if the Lord wills. But that says, you lost your sense of my righteousness. Then it says in chapter 3 and verse 7, they lost a sense of God's presence. It were just casual and familiar around God. And they didn't even know that they had left God. Said, you come back to me. And they said, we hadn't gone anywhere. We're still right here. They had no idea they were, quote, out on God. Then you lost, they lost their sense of obedience. And now I know that for in some cases, you feel like Malachi chapter 3 is the only verse we ever use is the verse about tithing, and we will get to that. But it's really in the greater sense of obedience, that they lost their sense of obeying God. And now you can see how the obedience part, the tithing part, fits in the whole scheme. God said, you lost your love, you lost your honor, you lost your sense of my holiness, you lost your sense of my uh, righteousness, the sense of my presence. No wonder you're not obeying. And then the last one is you lost a sense of your respect for me. And that's where we're going to go this week as you mark those things down. You can read ahead tomorrow and find in chapter 2 verse 17 where the next wherein occurs. So God is criticizing Israel. Let's go to verse number 7 of chapter 1. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. You remember last night I told you about four feet tall, this table that is there. This is where they would bring their offering to God and they would put it on the table. And they said that that table, watch what he says, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? 
They had no idea that they were violating the holiness of God. And how did God tell them in response? They said, you, you know, you're losing your sense of my holiness. He said, you say that the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now, this is, this is a strong idea. Let me, let me demonstrate this idea. This is the flag of the United States. If you are an American, this flag ought to mean something to you. Brother Fred, don't I remember, didn't you serve in the military, Brother Fred? So this flag, you, you did as well, preacher, you did too. So this flag means something. By the way, Brother Hoff, I, I forgot, and Brother Fred was pointing to use you instead of him, basically throwing you under the John bus. So this flag means a lot. What if I came in tonight walked over to that flag, borrowed a cigarette lighter from a church member, <laughs> Joe is just naughty, and stopped pointing, and, <laughs> and took a lighter and lit the flag on fire. What's the matter? I'm going to go to prison? I thought you were going to say I'm going to go to hell. The, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to prison. What else? What's going to happen? I, well, I don't know about that. I would be asked to leave this place. Why? It's desecration. Here's the problem. More y'all would be upset about a flag being burnt in the house of God than you would be the very holiness of God. Get all bent out of shape. They burn in the flag. I, I hate when they burn the flag. What does God feel like when you come to church with no sense of His holiness at all? The absence of holiness is so pronounced in our lives, it is frightening to think that we name the name of Christ and yet are so up in arms about whatever latest social drama is going on when the truth is the holiness of God and its offense ought to disturb us fundamentally and exponentially more. God said, you're offering polluted bread. That word polluted, it's that idea of desecration. It's to stain. It is to violate. And God said, you're Offering me offerings that are polluted. Well, if I ask you at the, today, I say, how many of you would like to offer God polluted offerings? You say, I would never do that. Why would I offer God polluted offerings? You say, well, how does that happen? Well, God is saying to them, I demand holiness in my people. Holiness is becoming to my house. Holiness belongs to God. And yet when we offer, as they did, the blind, the lame, the sick, the torn, when we offer a less than expected offering to God, now I'm not talking just about your money, because I'm going to talk about eight or nine different areas of our lives tonight, if I can ever get there before midnight. But the idea is just simply that we must consider in our lives the holiness of God. Note further as it says, In that ye say the table of the Lord is contemptible. What is contemptible? If I took the same flag and instead of burning it, I cast it on the ground and stomped on it and wiped my feet on it and did vile things with that flag on the ground, what would you say? You say, well, he's... That's ruining it. That's having no contempt, no or having contempt, no regard for the flag. How much more so the holiness of God we are staining and we are desecrating and we are ignoring. And this is why God criticized Israel. What is holiness? I think this is important to grasp this singular idea before we go any further. 
Holiness is all which is consistent with God and His character. Everything that is consistent with God and His character is holiness. What's God's character? He's holy. So anything in my life that's not consistent with God's character and God's holiness, or in other words, everything that doesn't look like God in my life is unholy. And everything that looks like God is holy. Truthfully, without me saying anything else, There's a lot to fix in our hearts. So, ah, speak for yourself, preacher. I am. And then I'm speaking to you as well. How much of what is in your life would God say, I recognize that? When you're raising children, what happens is you start to notice things in your kids. The stuff you notice most about them is when they're bad and they act like you. They get that trait or character from you. And every once in a while you get a glimmer of hope from a child that says they may be grasping something here. And when they do, that glimmer of hope says, well, that, that's a little bit like me. I wonder how much in our life is a little bit like God and how much is a lot like us. Everything is consistent with God and His character, His holiness. I want to point tonight to several areas of our lives to consider about what is really holiness in our lives. <clears throat> Think of it this way. The people of Malachi's day no longer saw the elements or the things of God as holy. And when you lose a sense of God as his love and you lose a sense of his honor, then it's easy that you will lose a sense of his holiness. And when we lose a sense of his holiness, we deserve the criticism of God. When we start whining and complaining, I'm not even sure if God loves me. I don't even know how this is going to be. Can God provide for me? Can God take care of me? You're losing a sense of his love. When you lose a sense of respect for God's honor when you lose that sense of his honor that I'm going to tell you tonight that you are on this same path that the children of Israel were and what's frightening to me as I read the book of Malachi is how much Israel is like me this morning in my devotions I was reading in the book of Hosea and I was struck again with how kind and gracious and merciful God is but yet at the same time how mischievous Israel was and back and forth as they were on a swing righteousness and holiness and de desecration and back to holiness and back and forth this is where we are we're con seemingly on a constant swing here's what happens look at verse number seven watch what he says or let's we'll start in six from last night a son honoreth his father you remember we talked about that serving his master if I be, then be a father, God says, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts, watch this, O priests that despise my name. Think about that for just a minute. Despising the name of God? He said, well, I would never do that. I would never take the name of God in vain. I would never cast dispersion on the name of God. Well, think about it a little deeper with me. The priests, they were the spiritual leaders and they were the one who were just despising God's very name. What is the name of God? Oh, the name is the name that is above every name. The name that at the, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is at that name. The Father, He is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is God, and God, as God himself, the priests were just despising the very name of God. His name had no authority in their life. They had no permission to speak in their life. They did and lived their life their own way. Every time we live our own lives, our, our lives, our own way, we are despising the very name of God. 
And God is criticizing them for them ignoring who he is in their lives. And yet they are the ones who are supposed to be serving. Well, as leadership goes, so goes the people. And they were led to despise the very name of God. They treated it badly. They had contempt for it. They saw it as despicable. They saw no dignity in it at all. They looked at God's name and it had no power or authority in their life. The second thing I see tonight is they were also filled with contempt. That's the idea of saying I have no regard for anything. It's beneath my consideration. It is something that is worthless. And how could God be worthless? Notice what he says. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? And he says, ye have offered polluted bread upon my altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. They saw and held God in contempt. You say, Brother O'Malley, how could God's people do that? Well, I've seen it in church. I've seen contempt for baptism. I've seen contempt for the Lord's Supper. I've seen contempt for local evangelism. I've seen contempt for world evangelism. I've seen contempt for Sunday school. I've seen contempt for, for uh, attendance of church. I've seen contempt for singing. I've seen contempt for passing out tracts. In every way, I've seen it happen. What do you mean, baptism? Well, there are some people who just find it a time waster. It's like, couldn't you just do that alone? I remember uh, in another time or not in a service and take up our time and slow us from getting to the restaurant. Well, I'd just love to see the baptism water stirred in our churches, period. But I can remember being a part of a large church, maybe around 3,000, 3,500. And as a member of that church, when baptisms were done, people would walk around milling about, never sitting there paying attention to the one who was getting baptized that day. I've seen contempt for the Lord's table where people just haphazardly say, oh, great, we're having the Lord's table tonight. Now I have to get right with God in order for me to take this stuff. I've seen contempt for evangelism to say, well, there's no need for us to do outreach. God's going to save the ones he wants to save anyway, whether we do anything about it or not. And so then we start to act or practically live like we're Calvinists. And then we get to the place where you say, well, then I don't want to pass out tracts and I don't want to go on door-to-door -door visitation and I don't want to do any outreach. And we might as well not do any missions outreach either. And then we walk around with contempt for the things of God. And it's a criticism that God raised. And he said, look, you ought not to be doing this. I mentioned to you, yesterday I was working on an article or an essay or a very, very long article about why people say church is boring and what really is the answer. And in that article I deal with, and it's something I'll post later, but in that article I deal with a th simple thought that oftentimes we are just Christians on Sunday. And the rest of the week you could classify us as practical atheists. Now I know that that's abrasive and I know that that's harsh. No, it's seemingly hard, but think through it with me for just a minute. If God's holiness has no influence in my life at the house and has no influence, holy, his holiness has no influence on my life in the workplace and it has no influence when I'm alone and has no influence when I'm in a group of people and has no influence in my life, then practically you're just living the Christian life on Sundays and Wednesdays. <clears throat> and even then, maybe not Wednesdays. That's no different than being filled with contempt, as the priests say. They had no regard for the Lord's table at all. They say, well, that's just nothing. That table of the Lord where you put the offering, that's nothing. We're, we're going to bring what we want to offer God. That's a, that, that doesn't mean anything. And these are the priests. That doesn't mean anything. And the people, it's easy for them to say, well, those it used to be holy, but now it's not holy anymore. And if we move the goalposts or we change the rules of the game, we have no authority to do so. 
You can't change the rules that God set. He said, this is what I expect. He said, don't give me the blind. Don't give me the lame. Don't give me the torn. Don't give me the sick. And if that's what you're offering, then you're saying I have no respect or regard for the things of God. Church attendance. Now I can't holler at the ones that aren't here because they can't hear me. That means I can only holler at the ones that are here. And you are here, so there's no reason to holler at you. But there's something about church attendance and our level of contempt for God. This is His house. We are His people. There ought to be something in our lives that brings us here. And I ought to want to be with the people of God when they gather. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Paul said to the Hebrew believers, don't set aside or neglect or ignore the things of God. This is what was happening. Notice what they, the, the priests were offering the polluted, not the poor. That which is stained and dirty and unwanted by God. God deserves our very best. They offered the worst and not the best. They had stained hands and stained hearts and their words were stained. Everything about them in verse number seven says they had no regard for the things of God. They had no regard for what God wanted in the ways of God and the word of God. They had no regard for anything. I don't want to live that life. I don't want to live the life without I am staining the holiness of God. Because when I do that, then there's this gross inconsistency between what I say I believe and what I actually believe. And this is wrong. God criticized Israel. We have a whole book, and I remind you yet again, God will give these seven criticisms through the, the ministry of Malachi, whose name means messenger, and he will give this message to Malachi. Malachi will deliver the message and say nothing for 400 years. Seven criticisms. And tonight we're talking about how God's people lost their sense of holiness. Tonight as, as we talk about this, I want you to see what we are polluting. I hope you can see that on the screen or the wall behind me here. But as I watch in our modern services and in our churches, we have a sense of defilement. We are defiling the house of God and our, this idea of a ritual or a moral defilement of who we are as a people against the holiness of God, that we are staining ourselves. Remember where Daniel said, I will not eat the king's meat. I will give a dip, I want a different diet that I can follow, so I will not take part of what he is offering. There is that distinction or that separation. Separation is not an old idea, sorry. Separation is not an old-fashioned idea. It's the mark of holiness of God, where we pull back from those things. When I say old-fashioned, let me say it this way where some people will refer to a, a traditional way as old school. Holiness is the original old school. And it's not out of date, and it's not out of fashion, and it's still expected by God. And so if you and I are going to live our lives consistent with who God is and His character, all that God is and His character, then by all means there ought to be a distinction between us and the world. These priests were defiling the temple of God or the house of God, the temple of God, and the things of God. They were disturbing the holiness of God. They were desecrating the holiness of God. Then you think about who are we as believers? Well, we're the temple of God. The Spirit of God is in residence here in us. And if He is in residence in us, then everything I say, he hears. Everything. He even knows the thoughts 
and the intent of our heart. You say, well, I didn't say it, but you thought it and he still knew it. God sees what your eyes see. God goes where you go. What you allow to entertain yourself is what you're doing with the Holy Spirit. You're bringing the Holy Spirit with you to see, hear, and experience what your flesh wants to see, hear, and experience. You say, well, I would never be like the priest who defiled and offered polluted bread. You're the temple of God. He dwells in you. He wants us holy. Whatever you allow to entertain you is what you're willing to accept. Whatever you allow to amuse you is what you're willing to experience in your mind. I can tell you of people who thought they could control their pornography, and they couldn't. Pornography viewing is violating the holiness of God. Adultery violates the holiness of God. But so does your gossip and bad attitude as well. You say, well, don't lump me in with that. God lumped in together adulterers and witch people who practice witchcraft. They all get lumped in. They all, if you read chapter 3 and cha uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, you'll see they're all put together there. God wants his holiness protected and seen as sacred. Let's talk about some of the practical ways of God's holiness that we ought to be considering. Number one, I want you to think about how God's holiness ought to be at play in our regular day-to-day -day living. These are the people, God's people. And if we're not careful, our living can pollute the holiness of God. When we offer God not the pure, but the polluted, not the, def not the expected, but the defective. When our lives look like the world, when our hearts look like the world, when our hands look like the world, and we lose our distinction in the world, then we are no longer bearers or carriers of the holiness of God. There ought to be a distinction in our living. If you are out in the world, now I know it would be easy to say, dressed like the world. And that for some might be an aggravation point. I'm not here to aggravate you. I'm here to teach a point. You can put on all of the right clothes in style and fashion. And if your heart is as filthy as a chimney, all you did was put wrapping paper on a pig. You say, well, that's pretty strong. I really called it back. I had something else I wanted to say. So I feel good that I didn't say that. This is, that's pride, by the way, I'm sorry. But holiness ought to influence how we decide things. In dealing with people who commit adultery, I will ask, did it not bother you? That you are violating the holiness of God. When dealing with people who have committed sin. And you say, were you aware that while you were doing that, that violated the holiness of God? If holiness is holiness, then it ought to show up in our living. Secondly, holiness has to show up in our thinking. I can't do that because of the holiness of God. I can't say that because of the holiness of God. I can't do that because of the holiness of God. If holiness is part of our thinking and we are considering everything, every decision we make is made based on the holiness of God, then all of a sudden our lives become committed or set apart, consecrated to Him. 
But if holiness is just all that we think about on Sunday and nothing else between Monday than Saturday, I bring you back to the thought of, are we nothing more than practical atheists? Holiness has to influence me at some point, and if it doesn't, I'm wrong. Holiness ought to influence our prayer life. What I'm going to say is going to seem offensive. And I'm not afraid of being offensive if my motive is right. And in this, my heart is right. My motive is correct. When, oftentimes, when we pray, we don't really think about what we're saying. We just repeat the phrases we've heard. And then after about 30 seconds, we're out of words to use because we really don't talk to God. If I understood to whom and with whom I was conversing or speaking, my conversation with God would change. I would think about what I'm saying. I, and again, this is no, I have no malice in my heart as I say this. Oftentimes when we pray over the food, it is just a set aside time to go through the motion. You could probably finish the prayer by me starting the phrases that we weave together to make possible our prayer to bless the food, right? God bless the food and the... Hands that prepared it. Whoa. It's kind of like going to a fast food place and placing your order, and you're saying the stuff, and they're not listening to the stuff, and you're not talking to each other, you're talking at each other. In the same prayer, you could say, in the offering, you could say, God bless those who give and those who don't have to give heard the same phrase and, and again it's not critical there's no malice in my heart I'm just saying in our prayer life if the holiness of God was truly at work in our thinking and in our living then I would realize I am communicating with the one who created everything I see and it ought to influence how I speak to him I think our prayers ought to be sincere I, I don't need, I don't think we need flowery prayers. I think we just need sincere prayers. I think we need prayers that are affected by the holiness of God that realize, oh, wretched man that I am. The kind of prayer from Isaiah when he said uh, that my, my lips are corrupt, my whole being is corrupt, nothing, woe is me, for I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. There is nothing good about me. And what would change in our prayer life if we truly recognized the holiness of God when we spoke to him? Now, I know you'll, you'll say, well, boy, I don't ever want to pray when Brother O'Malley's in the room. It's not me you got to worry about. You're speaking to God. He criticized the priests, the leaders, and said, you, you're the ones who've polluted. I think we bring pollution in our living. I think we bring pollution in our thinking. We bring pollution in our prayer lives. Fourthly, I believe we bring pollution in our homes. Our televisions, our movies, our streaming television, our internet, all of these bring a main line to our home of things that are not holy. I'll never forget, I had an older preacher say to me, John, if you're going to watch two people become physically connected with each other on screen, it is the same as you inviting them into your home to do that on your couch while you're sitting there watching them. Wow. It's quite a statement. 
what do we tolerate with our entertainment that violates the holiness of God? I think that we polluted our homes, we polluted our prayers, prayer life, and we polluted our thinking. And we polluted our living and we didn't even realize it. Yet we'll look at this passage and say, those sorry priests, how could they do that to God? And then when you put this practical holiness involved in our lives. Now mind you, holiness is not something I do to please God or to win or curry favor with God. Holiness is who he is and I'm his child and I ought to look like my dad. And when we bring pollution in the home, what happens? We're hurting our homes. Then there's pollution in our marriages. Oh my. If we're not careful, we can allow bitternesses to become so great in our lives, they begin to create a, a canyon or what we'd say a chasm between the spouses. And to all of a sudden, you're so far apart. When you as fellow worshipers ought to be embracing the holiness of God, the absence of holiness in our marriages are evident by the way that we casually deal with each other and carnally deal with each other. Holiness is missing in our marriages. Holiness is also missing in our conversations. Oh my goodness. Listen how we speak to each other. And please allow me to press further into this and say to you, watch how you speak online if you're using social media. It's amazing how emboldened people become behind a keyboard and say things they would never, ever say to someone's face. But yet because they have a keyboard and they have an input box to type in how they feel, they actually type how they feel instead of thinking, let holiness influence the way we communicate with each other. Brother Brent, while I know that you are friends with your pastor and his wife, if you would speak to Shauna more harshly than you would speak to Mrs. Hoff, then you've missed the point of holiness. Shauna should get your kindest tone and friendliest words. And if Mrs. Hoff gets those and Shauna doesn't, that means holiness is not influencing your heart. Now, I know that you're close with the Hoffs, and I know that you can tease and pick, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what happens at home, how we speak and how we act with each other. Holiness ought to influence that. If holiness is present in this church, we won't gossip. This won't happen. We won't lie. We won't say mean things. We won't slander someone. We will not criticize them. Because you say, I can't. That's my brother in Christ. He loves me. as my, Let's say, are, are you gay? Joseph. Joseph, the other day. Joseph. Let's say I hated Joseph. I don't hate you, Joseph. I like you. But let's just say I did. I couldn't hate you because of the holiness of God. So, well, Joseph said mean things about you. I still can't hate him. He is my brother. He is a child of God. I am a child of God. I can't hate him. So, well, they did wrong by me. It doesn't matter. We let offenses go. You say, well, they deserve. <laughs> you deserved hell. That's what you deserve. So don't start with the they deserve stuff. The truth is the holiness of God ought to influence the way we speak to each other and with each other as a church family. Talk about church for just a moment while we're there. Holiness ought to be at home here. Our homes ought to be embassies of heaven's culture, and so should our churches be. A greater gathering of holiness where we have a respect and reverence for God and his word 
and even if you'll let me say the leadership of this church, that God places men in leadership. It's not to say they're perfect. God knows they're not perfect. Mrs. Hoff knows he's not perfect. <laughs> but God puts imperfect people in with a divine calling. And in that divine calling, they will exercise their gift to lead. And that's a wonderful thing. But holiness ought to be at home here. The Bible says, Psalm uh, 95 maybe, it says, holiness becomes his house. Holiness looks good here. Last one. Holiness ought to influence our praising. When our praises become bragging about ourselves, holiness is not influencing that. Pride is influencing that. Holiness ought to be a part of our singing. Holiness ought to be a part of our giving. Why do I give? I give because he's holy. I, I do everything that is consistent with all who God is and his character. So when we sing, when we praise, when we give testimony, we do all of these things because of the holiness of God. And God called out the priests in this third call out that he's given to him, the third criticism, he criticized them because they lost a sense of his, their, his love for them. They lost a sense of his honor that was due to him. And then they lost a sense of his holiness. And when I look at where we are today in our churches, I think we offer a lot of pollution. And I think we ought to stop. Pollution. How much of what we offer God is polluted? So I don't like that question. Well, better answer that one here than when you get before him and have to answer something stronger. So, well, Brother O'Malley, are you holding yourself up as saying you are the example of following the holiness of God? No. But I sure want to. Not want to be the example. I just want to pursue His holiness. And there are some days I do real well. And other days, not so much. And there are some days I think, Oh, this flesh, it doesn't want, it wants to stain the holiness of God. And tonight I'm asking you to consider how much of what your spiritual life is, is influenced by God's holiness. The best thing that looks good in this, we know that God inhabits the praises of his people. But you know what looks good in God's house? It's this very thing. All that it, God is and is consistent with his character. How much of holiness is influencing your thinking, your living, your prayer life, your marriage, your conversations, this church? your praise life, how much of holiness is influencing you and how much pollution are you dragging in here every week? Would you stand with me? Dear Father, with great earnestness, we've looked at your word tonight and find it ever so convicting to realize how far astray we are from your holiness. We're casual in our conversations with each other and never once considering holiness. We're abrasive with people and even in our own marriages and we become to the place where we are filled with staining and desecrating your very holiness. It's so easy to criticize the priests of that day. Yet we look at ourselves and we realize that we're a mess. Father, bring us back to the place where holiness influences our living, our thinking, our praying, our homes, our marriages, our conversations, our churches, our praises. In every single way, dear God, I ask you that we will be a people who will not pollute your house nor pollute your holiness. 
heart begins to play and some have already healed, I urge you to pray. God had criticisms. They were real. They were right. God continues to answer that prayer in my heart and in yours. Appreciate you being here. Hope you can come tomorrow night. If you're listening online, I hope you can be here tomorrow night. Brother Mark, would you ask the Lord to dismiss us, please?